Um, morning, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to talk to you about something slightly different this morning. It's always good to start the morning with something new. Um, central node biopsy is now in operation that not only breast surgeons but also other uh, general surgeons and so forth are aware of. It's an operation that we now carry out routinely. Um, it has a success rate, an identification rate of in excess of 96%. In our own hospital, the success rate is 98.6. And you will find similar numbers at other sites. And we know that the technique works particularly well when you combine blue dye with radioisotope. So if we have a technique that works really well, why do we need to replace it with another one? Why do we need to explore other options at all? Well, central node biopsy has uh, drawbacks. First of all, those to do with the radioisotope use. It's not so much uh, radiation exposure for the surgeon and for the team and for the patient, but it's to do with the legislation around the use of radioisotope, and I'm sure the surgeons here will, will uh, recognize that. In breast surgery, there's a need to <coughs> store up all the surgical waste and for somebody to come and count the radiation before the waste can be disposed of. And um, that can be a major issue at sites without nuclear medicine facilities. And then, of course, uh, lymphocentigraphy provides very poor imaging of the area. The blue dye itself, of course, obscures the surgical field. The patient is left with a tattoo. Often the tattoo remains for years. And in uh, areas where breast surgery being now increasingly undertaken as a day case facility, uh, as a day case uh, specialty. Uh, if the operating room is remote from intensive care facilities, the rare occurrence of a, an allergic reaction to blue dye can be quite a, a, a major uh, incident. How about worldwide? Well, well, worldwide we are privileged because we have access to central node biopsy. And in the developed world, roughly 60% of patients have access to this procedure. <coughs> in China, that falls down to 5%. And that is because of the fact that the Chinese government does not allow clinicians to use uh, radioisotope. And in developing countries beyond China, it's, it falls even below 5%. So in some parts of the world, there is certainly a need for a different technique for doing the same thing. So about 10 years ago, <coughs> I came up with the idea of developing a magnetic alternative to central node biopsy. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. And uh, what I did really was I, I made a link between developing technology at UCL for the development of a handheld magnetometer and my knowledge that there were contrast agents used for imaging the liver that were made out of iron oxide. And these contrast agents were used um, as intravenous injections, and I decided to try and develop this technique using these uh, contrast agents injected into the breast subcutaneously. And you can see that originally the work between UCL was, uh, this was collaborative with the University of Houston, so in fact the original magnetometer was called the London-Houston magnetometer. And it really came about when I met uh, Quentin Pankhurst, who later became professor of physics at uh, uh, UCL and then headed the Royal Institution, uh, largely based around his work in the magnetic uh, territory. And uh, this is really the, the, the development of a handheld <coughs> magnetometer for central node biopsy was really the only area that went as far as uh, a clinical trial in this field. And the other key uh, collaborator was Audrey Spreisdakis, who works at the University of Houston. And I also involved Margaret Hall Craggs, a consultant at UCLH. She's now a professor of radiology there. So the vision here was really to, to take this operation, which is largely a diagnostic procedure, it's not a therapeutic procedure, out of the operating room, perform it in the outpatient department perhaps, or even allow the radiologists to do some surgery. Of course, they do a lot of surgery now. So that was the idea. And uh, the hope was that this technique would facilitate that um, 
and free up a lot of operating space. And at that time, we were very interested in uh, being able to um, know the nodal status of patients before we take them to theatre. Of course, now we're slightly less interested in that. And the brief that I gave the, the physicists was to be able to detect 100 micrograms of magnetic dye within 3 centimeters of the probe tip. I estimated that if you, if you look at the average central node, so long as you have a detection of 3 centimeters by pushing the probe into the skin, you could detect most of these nodes. And two of my research fellows, Ayanti Guanacacera and Tejal Joshi, worked on the initial prototype, which you can see here. It was quite cumbersome. It consisted of a magnetic coil which generated a magnetic field, and the central detector um, was able to detect Pico-Tesla um, changes in this magnetic field. And the capsule contained Endorem, a contrast agent, and an SPIO, a superpower magnetic um, iron oxide contrast agent. And, and this was really uh, we were able to show in the laboratory that it, it, it was working and it also had pinpoint precision in terms of its uh, detection. So the next step was really to take it to the, to the clinic. I didn't really think there was a need to carry out an animal trial, <coughs> bearing in mind that the uh, uh, superpower magnetic iron oxide was already in clinical use. So on a series of uh, 10 patients, um, we, we started doing this clinical trial in 2006. And you can see what the operating room looked like. On the left-hand side, there was a laptop with a processor underneath it. And next to the laptop, a thermos flask containing liquid nitrogen. And in the liquid nitrogen, a, a, a superparagonetic um, um, metal, essentially, was, was uh, dipped into this. And it's this uh, flask that uh, was the detector behind the technique. It was called a squid. And it, uh, fortunately, with technological advances, it was possible to cut that step out. But on one occasion, that thermos flask tipped over, and um, liquid nitrogen ended up on the theater floor. And you can imagine what that did. And fortunately, I'm here to be able to tell you the tale. But there was a lot of smoke coming out from underneath the patient. Um, and this is a patient having an injection of Endorem. That was produced by Gerbe at the time. And that was what I was using initially. And uh, of course, the fact that uh, um, uh, SPIOs were also brown-black meant that with this technique, not only you would do away with the radioisotope, but you were also able to have a color and that would facilitate identification of the node. And you can see the data here on the initial 10 patients. We were able to detect all 19 nodes. There was one technical failure of the device. But apart from that, the procedure was completely successful in all cases. And that was, of course, very encouraging. And uh, because I was injecting on the day of uh, surgery prior to an MRI scan with a delay of about four to five hours, in some cases the node was very much uh, black, very easy to identify. And uh, you can see here on cut section, we were slicing nodes at that time and carrying out imprint cytology for real time uh, uh, reporting. And fortunately, because iron oxide is soluble, all of that iron oxide disappears during histopathological processing. And uh, the pathologist didn't really know that I was doing this until one day she came to me and she said, well, you know, your nodes are rather bruised. And we worked out the bruising was hemosiderin deposition in the nodes, which was visible if you looked for it, but not that visible. And then I relocated to Guy's Hospital on the 1st of January 2009, not realizing that I actually shot myself in the foot because I moved from two legal entities to a separate two legal entities. So from UCL, UCLH to Guy's and St. Thomas's and King's College London. And the basis under which I was allowed to use this device, which was not CE marked, was because I was working in one legal entity. So by moving to a separate legal entity, I had to go through eight months before I was able to start another phase and recruit another 51 patients. And you will note here that the results from the 51 patients using exactly the same technique that I used at UCLH were somewhat disappointing with an identification rate uh, of 86% of, uh, uh, overall. And after a little bit of thought, I worked out the reasons behind this were that Gerbe was in fact not producing Endorem. The, the stuff was being produced by an American company based in Boston. They were having legal squabbles, and I was using the same uh, iron oxide that I had used at UCH, the same shelf life, but of course it was degrading. And that was why the, 
the results were somewhat less good. Now, my work led on to a spin-out company called Endomagnetics. I maintained a completely academic involvement in this throughout, for obvious reasons. But um, the company is uh, part-owned by UCL, which is, of course, where I was working. And so the work led on to the Centimag device, which you can see on the left-hand side. But then Endorem, with the legal squabbles I mentioned, uh, decided to withdraw. Um, sorry, Gerbe decided to withdraw Endorem from the market. So then there was a magnetometer, but no iron oxide <coughs> that we could use with it. So I decided to help the spin-out company develop a, the first um, CE-approved injectable iron oxide called Sienna Plus which you can see here, and, and this is now how the technique is carried out, and uh, it's been carried out already at, um, it's been used at 50 sites in Europe with over 9,000 patients who have had this technique. Um, I, I hasten to add to my dismay because I would like to do a randomized control trial, and I'll tell you a little bit about that a bit later. So um, when the Centimag device was CE marked, that was October 2011, I took a little bit of a gamble and I organized a weekend meeting for seven principal investigators to meet in London within six days of the CE marking. Unfortunately, the CE marking did actually happen. Uh, but it took another three months before we, we recruited the first patient. And I'm sure most of you are aware of the fact that because these devices are CE marked, and CE marking means um, uh, marketing authorization, um, they are often never used in patients. And the claims that you read on information uh, on the IFU, the information for use, of any device really does not reflect any clinical information. So this uh, device is licensed or marketed for the purpose of central node biopsy, but the first woman to receive Sienna Plus was the first woman who participated in the Centimag trial. And the Centimag trial was a similar design to the original proof of principle, but um, the aim was to recruit 160 patients across seven sites, and you can see here that it was a non-inferiority trial. We, we were happy to accept that the technique was as good as if the identification rate uh, was above or equal to 92%. And, um, you know, the advantage of surgical trials is that if you play your, your cards right, it is actually very easy to recruit, and the outcome measures are very obvious. Straight after the operation, you know what the identification is. So recruitment was very, very rapid, as you can see here, and within six months we accrued the 160 patients and um, the type of patients we were uh, recruiting were the average patient that you would see. Half of these patients were symptomatic and half of them were screen detected. And 21% uh, of patients had uh, involved um, central nodes. Again, um, about uh, 20 or 19% of patients had non-invasive disease, uh, mainly DCIS, but everybody else had invasive breast cancer. The procedure is uh, very straightforward. You can see here how it's done. And um, I tend to use diathermy to, to cut the skin. But what you will note is that during the procedure, metal retractors have to be removed because, of course, the ma magnetometer can detect these retractors. And you would have thought that using stay sutures, fingers, and plastic retractors will alienate uh, surgeons. But in fact, 36 surgeons were quite happy to be trained the procedure took just as long as a standard sentinel node biopsy, and I guess surgeons are excited by new techniques, and they find a way to resolve problems rather than uh, ponder over them. This particular central node was, as you will see, blue on one side and black on the other side, and, uh, and it was not hot with a gamma probe, and it contained a micrometastasis. So the identification rate in terms of a successful central node biopsy with a magnetic technique was 94.4, and with the combined or standard technique, it was 95. So very similar results, and they fell within the non-inferiority margin, so we published this claiming that it was non-inferior to the standard technique. Looking at patients with involved nodes, you will note that two patients in the bottom left there, two patients were missed with the magnetic technique and one patient with the standard technique, meaning one patient who had a, an involved node was only detected with the magnetic technique and so forth. There were no serious adverse events directly related to the uh, iron oxide that we were using. 
Now, this is work uh, performed by Laura Johnson, a, a doctoral student of mine a few years ago. She looked at 131 uh, central nodes in 51 patients together with Serapin, the pathologist, and she was able to show that iron oxide is gobbled up by macrophages. And you can see with pearl staining the macrophages scattered throughout the node on the middle picture just over here. And um, also, uh, iron oxide ends up in the subcapsular space of these central nodes. Now, when a trial is recruiting very fast and it's on the national portfolio, I saw no reason to close it, so I decided to continue recruitment and recruited over 350 patients um, in another six months. And that um, shed some very interesting light over how we perform central node biopsy in the UK. You will see in this graph A to G are the sites, and the red line shows you how many patients were recruited at each site. And the blue bar, the hatched blue bar, is the identification rate with a standard technique, and the black bar is the identification rate with a magnetic technique. And sites uh, A and F, the identification rate with a magnetic technique fell well short of 90%, and E and D, the identification rate with a standard technique fell way short of 90%. So it just showed that there is a very much a, a, a difference in technique across various sites. And I guess the, one of the advantages of the clinical trial is it, it highlights the, the way that we work. And, and for the purpose of a trial, it's definitely important for the technique to be standardized. The magnetic technique was standardized. But um, we felt at the time that the central node biopsy is very straightforward and there would be no need to, to standardize it. And of course, perhaps there is. This is the data from the extended uh, trial, and uh, you, you'll note we have 347 analyzable patients, and that the identification rate now fell short of what we found before. So it was now 91.9, and it was no, no longer within our non-inferiority uh, non margin. And this uh, really meant that the surgeons who uh, operated on the, the second 160 or so patients didn't do it in the same way that they did it for the first 160 patients. And um, there are various reasons why that should happen, perhaps greater confidence with the technique, less focus on, on detail, who knows. But this is obviously very interesting that, that it wasn't as good as it was initially. And um, let's move on to the next one. If you compare the, uh, the probes, one probe against the other probe, in other words, using radioisotope, um, the radioisotope alone against the magnetic technique, the results were non-inferior. So the, the, the iron oxide was really working as efficiently as the radioisotope, but perhaps injecting a different agent at a different site increased the identification rate. And way, maybe the way to address this issue is actually to, to inject the same substance, but in two different locations, and therefore get a, a higher number of, of, of nodes. This is again the data on involved patients with involved nodes, and this time four patients with involved nodes were missed with the magnetic technique and one patient with the uh, standard technique. A total of 826 lymph nodes were excised from these patients, an average of 1.9 or so nodes. And this really confirmed that the technique was not uh, increasing the number of nodes removed from the armpit, and of course we don't want to do that because it, removing too many nodes may increase the risk of lymphedema. Now, this is work by a different PhD student of mine, Bauke Aninga, and he, we developed a model to study this technique in, in, an, in an animal, in a, in a porcine model. And these are nodes with different amounts of iron, and he was able to, to show that you could grade the amount of iron that ended up in these nodes. And this, were, this work was undertaken at the Institut IRCAD in Strasbourg, simply because it's much easier to, to get uh, um, approvals on animal studies in France than it is in the UK, and we have maintained that link with Strasbourg. Now, of course, if the technique works in breast cancer, why not try melanoma? That's the obvious second cancer where central node biopsy is now increasingly being used. So uh, we developed a similar trial, and um, the, the apple, by the way, is uh, related to the fact that mela in Italian means apple. So it's an apple without a bite in it. So I'm, I'm allowed to use that. Um, <laughs> So the design of the trial was very similar, this time four sites, uh, again one site in Holland, three sites in the UK, again very swift recruitment, but we, we actually planned to open up um, six sites, and we had five sites raring to start, and the manufacturer decided that they were selling devices so well in Europe that they wouldn't give us uh, six probes, they'll only give us four. 
So I, I ex the recruitment was not as fast as I wanted it to be, and I extended the trial at no cost for another three months, and then decided to just close it and publish the data. In melanoma, the situation is somewhat different because you do need a lymphocytogram to guide the surgeon as to which basin to operate on. So some patients require an operation of three basins, two in the groin and one in the armpit, or, and so forth. So maybe two armpits and one groin, or just an armpit. So it depends which basin takes up the dye, and the dye tends to be injected around the site of where the melanoma was already excised. So the lymphocytogram is key here. And you can see that uh, per primary location, you can see the primary locations of the, of the tumors on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, the number of basins that were operated on by the surgeons. So uh, a good number of basins uh, required surgery. And this is the data per patient. And the identification rate per patient was 95.3% with a magnetic technique and exactly the same with the standard technique. This was a little bit uh, upsetting for me because it showed me that the melanoma surgeons were much more rigorous than the breast surgeons. And the melanoma surgeons are now plastic surgeons, so you can imagine how I felt about that. So um, now how do you deal with the, so again, the, the number of nodes removed was, was the same, about uh, two nodes per patient, and that was confirming that the particle size was right for this procedure. Now, how do you deal with the fact that in melanoma you need a lymphocytogram, and how are you going to use the magnetic technique without the lymphocytogram? So we decided the way forward was to link up the uh, iron oxide to radioisotope. And you would think, well, why would you want to do that? The technique is all about um, eliminating radioisotope. The reason is that by linking up radioisotope with iron oxide, you effectively um, prolong the half-life of radioisotope using iron oxide. So that, what that does is it means that in future you'll be able to uncouple the lymphocytogram, do it, say, this week, and then operate on the patient next week, and this time identify exactly the same node using the magnetic technique when it's, when it's no longer radioactive. And we were able to demonstrate that that works very well in, in, a, in a phantom, but it's just a complete headache to try and take it into the, into the clinical arena. But I'm, I'm still hoping that we'll be able to do that at some point in the future. So if it works in melanoma, it works in breast. The obvious uh, other place in breast surgery where we need a new technique is in localization of impalpable cancer because roughly 30% of our breast cancers now are screen detected, they're impalpable, and the surgeon needs help in identifying where the tumor is. And um, Munir Ahmed, another PhD student of mine, and I looked at the situation initially because there are new techniques out there already, like roll, radiocalc lesion and localization, where patients receive an injection of radioisotope into the lesion. And uh, SNOL, where this is combined with sentinel node biopsy, and so forth. And the question was, why were these techniques not already in clinical use? Bearing in mind there are already randomized controlled trials demonstrating that they work. And the reason was because the randomized control trial was actually not very good, and um, the, the enthusiasts continue to use the technique which they have developed, and the rest of us just use the fact that the trials weren't good enough to criticize them and carry on as we are, which is what happened with Roll. For over 20 years, Roll has been used in, in uh, Milan, and in fact, across the whole of Italy, everybody, most surgeons use Roll, and nobody use, uses wires. And the reason why they don't use wires is because the radiologist has to place these, so it's an extra visit for the, for the patient. The wire is sticking out of the breast, so there are scheduling issues. You cannot really send the patient off with a wire for days on end. At, at most, possibly, you can send them home with, one, with a wire for one night. But it's very uncomfortable for them to have this wire sticking out of their breast. And, um, we looked at, at various techniques, as I mentioned, of the alternatives used for localization. Some of them, interestingly, were also used for sentinel node biopsy. So this was, this was really not crazy to try and apply a technique that was developed for sentinel node biopsy for a different indication. And uh, you can see here the, the most promising uh, uh, techniques out there, um, I would say, are ultrasound, lesion localization, and, and the magnetic technique. And of course, the radioisotope ones are still um, uh, very serious contenders. And uh, radio-guided localization using a seed, and this is something that came from the urologists and a surgeon in uh, California decided to plant one of these seeds into a breast lesion and use it for localization. This is really the most promising of the radioactive-based techniques. And our uh, systematic review really confirmed that if you use one of these seeds, 
you significantly reduce the reoperation rate, the time in theater, and the re-excision rate. So, um, but this was, of course, a meta-analysis of very um, suboptimal uh, data, but nevertheless interesting. So uh, we took the, the idea back to Strasbourg and again carried out some experiments which uh, confirmed to us that injecting iron oxide into the breast won't just lead to scatter of the, of the dye and, and uh, that we were able to develop it in a way that would en ensure that the dye stayed in one location. And uh, that led on to a trial called mag Snow, and this was the magnetic alternative to, to SNOL, in other words, injecting iron oxide into impalpable breast cancers by a radiologist, and in, the dye would then travel to the lymph node at the same time, so you could do sentinel node biopsy and combine it with magnetic lesion or cart localization. And the first 30 patients of this uh, uh, study we published, and we've, we've uh, been very uh, uh, fortunate in that all lesions were identifiable with the magnetic technique. The radiologist loved it. You can see a radiologist here injecting iron oxide into the lesion using ultrasound. And what was uh, very uh, reassuring was the fact that we were seeing bullseye after bullseye after bullseye in terms of removing of, uh, lesions with wide local excision. And just to take you through this, this required a little bit of planning because um, the wire is detected with a magnetometer. So we had to convince the ethics committee that we we're going to carry out these operations without the wire. So we decided to only look at lesions that were identifiable by ultrasound just in case we were in a, in a situation where we had a patient asleep on a table and the magnetic technique failed. The other point to make is that these clips that you can see are made out of titanium. They were inserted by the radiologist at the time of in injecting the iron oxide into the tumors. And because they're made out of titanium, they're not detected by the magnetic technique. So the reason why they were placed there was purely so that we could carry out an x-ray of the specimen and confirm that the lesion, and the clip, was in the right site because the iron oxide itself is not visible on the specimen x-ray. So the clip allows us to see where the iron oxide was injected. And the clip cannot be detected with the handheld magnetometer. And this is the data. You can see that we trained ourselves with 13 palpable lesions, as it so happened, I operated on all those patients. And the uh, non-palpable patients were recruited at Guy's Hospital and in Cardiff, and in Enschede in, in Holland. Now, <coughs> that, uh, all that work led me to, uh, to decide to, to plan and to carry out a very large randomized control trial of 1,000 patients called MagStar. And I was really determined to do it. And the protocol is published on the British Journal of Surgery. And the, the design was very simple, 900 or so patients randomized to either the magnetic technique alone or the combined technique. And there was a trial within a trial that, because of the data I showed you earlier, suggesting that maybe the magnetic technique was missing patients who had involved nodes, which was not a good thing, I decided to include 194 patients with involved nodes. So there had to be a minimum of 194 patients with involved nodes. And I managed to get funding for, from the John Moulton Foundation to do this to across 10 sites. And you can see the inclusion criteria here. And uh, the condition that John Moulton placed over this trial was that the manufacturer would produce the uh, handheld devices for free and give us 500 vials of iron oxide for free. And they agreed to do that. But then they had a change of heart 18 months later because they were selling and they felt they were in a bubble. They were selling these devices. They decided to come back to me and say, well, actually, we're very sorry, Michael. We recognize that we, we had agreed to do this, but we are a small company and we need to buy, you need to buy the probes from us. And uh, they asked me to go back to the funder and I said, I won't. And they said, why not? And I said, because I think that the funder is right. You guys should, should are going to stand to gain from this and you should pay for the devices. So the trial is now shelved, I'm afraid. And uh, in terms of novel techniques for central node biopsy, you can see that uh, in the UK we're very well placed because both the magnetic technique and the contrast technique with microbubbles have been developed in the UK. And in my view, those two are the most promising for central node biopsy. Now, when you've had a good idea, you, you, you know that it's a good idea when other people are doing the same thing. And uh, there have now been seven uh, trials of the magnetic technique. There's one that hasn't published yet at MD Anderson in Texas, and the others 
have published, including a Nordic group, which published two weeks ago, so the Nordic data is not on here. And this is our own meta-analysis of these trials. And you will see from the top uh, forest plot that, first of all, the identification rates are high across the board. So the technique is also clearly working for central node biopsy. And the lymph node net retrieval, interestingly, when you, when you amalgamate the data and you look at it, um, it shows that the magnetic technique does indeed increase the number of nodes retrieved compared to the standard technique. And clearly, as a result of that, the false negative rate, if anything, is erring on the side of being better with a magnetic technique. And that would be explained by the fact if you, re if you remove more nodes, you're going to be less likely to, to miss involved nodes. And this really reassures me, bearing in mind what I showed you the data was from the Centimag trial. Now, there is no gain without pain. And the, the pain of this technique is the artifact that you can see when you inject iron oxide into the tissues. Now, of course, we knew that there was an artifact. This is, these are the scans that I took in, uh, undertook on patients. But the assumption the company made was that the iron oxide would be reabsorbed from the body. It will just be simply broken down by the body's uh, iron oxide uh, and hemoglobin breakdown mechanisms within 30 days. And the authorities in Europe accepted their claim that it was going to be reabsorbed within 30 days. So um, you can see the injection site is an issue because it, can, it creates an artifact. But fortunately, the artifact is not visible on mammography or ultrasound or histology. So, and these are the mainstays of, of uh, follow-up imaging in patients with breast cancer. But what you can also see is what I have been in, interested in all along and still am. I think the big advantage of this technique is the fact that you can see the central node. You can actually image the central node. You can also see the lymphatic tract feeding into that central node. And the image resolution of MRI is such that you can detect macrometastases within the central node. And bearing in mind that 80% of patients undergoing central node biopsy are found to have a negative uh, central node, I think the future of the axilla is going to be imaging rather than surgery. Now, this is data that's already in the public domain by a Sheffield group, Cooper et al. and Linda Wilde. And you can see that they looked at axillary MRI and its ability to identify involved nodes. And what they found was, if you focus on the column of MRI studies of type of MRI using ultra-small paramagnetic iron oxide enhanced MRI, you will note that the identification rate, sorry, not the sensitivity and specificity are very high. Sensitivity 98% and specificity 96%. Now, they went on and published a second paper looking at the cost effectiveness of actually replacing central node biopsy with MRI or with PET. And their conclusion was that you could, it was cost effective to replace central node biopsy with MRI, but not with PET. And the mere fact they were asking themselves that question really shows you the, the attraction of, of going down the magnetic route when it comes to central node biopsy. Now, back in 2000, I undertook my um, doctoral thesis in MRI and looked at every, every angle of MRI and wrote this uh, uh, very provocative paper with Michael Baum, Does Breast Cancer Exist in a State of Chaos? <laughs> we were very fascinated by the angiogenesis and, and, and the relationship between contrast enhancement and distribution of blood vessels within the breast. Um, but we, it was also obvious to me at that time that uh, uh, MRI was really a form of imagery and that there was a need to develop techniques that would change the way we operate. Otherwise, um, just looking at a scan and recommending a mastectomy is not really an advance. It's pushing us back 30 years. And uh, others have demonstrated that by using MRI in practice, it increases the mastectomy rate by roughly 30%. So um, I see the magnetic technique, if you like, as, as one of the tools that will change the way we operate, rather than just looking at an image and doing exactly the same. And um, this is not really the future, this is the present. And this is a, uh, an MRI uh, suite at, uh, at Massachusetts, Boston. And um, there, there are similar setups in China and in the Middle East. And you will see that the ceiling mounted MRI machine is able to image patients very swiftly. And then the images of MRI are co located with uh, CT scanning and pre-op imaging and presented to the surgeon on a flat screen. And this is already used for neurosurgery and it may have applications in other parts of surgery. And the, it's very easy to re-image the patient within a minute, minute or so. The MRI machine can then be rotated within a minute and used to image the patient next door. 
And I think we're going to see a lot of advances with uh, magnetic resonance imaging over the next five to ten years. So I hope I've convinced you that the magnetic technique for sentinel biopsy is feasible, it's not inferior, but it's also um, not been proven to be uh, as, as good as on a randomized controlled basis. And the reason that's quite important is because a lot of these companies uh, suffer from vested interest. And uh, the, when, you, when you're giving a technique to patients alongside blue dye, it's impossible to blind the surgeon to the presence of blue dye. So um, I'm just hinting at what I have already said in the meta-analysis that is about to come out in, the, in, a, in a journal. I think vested interest bias we, we all need to be aware of and look out for when it comes to devices and their evaluation. So I'm still convinced that a randomized control trial is needed. And for breast cancer surgery, magnetic localization, I feel, is an important application, perhaps even more important than sentinel node biopsy. And it may even replace the other techniques that I showed you. Thank you very much. And just lastly, if I, if I may, um, just to show people the number of people who get involved. So this is not really about me. This is about teamwork. And, and you can just imagine how many emails I receive when, when these trials are recruiting. <laughs>